instill some sanity into the traffic situation in Freetown. But he discovered that it's a danger to run when your bosses at central government are walking. Firstly, when we introduced the idea of towing the vehicles, we towed some of the ex-ministers vehicles. And uh, they came here to protect. I remember they towed the official car of the former Minister of Education, Professor Moses Jumbuya. They towed the vehicle of the official vehicle of a former Minister of Mine, the Honorable Ahmed Edward Tise. They towed the vehicle of the Honorable Iti Kamara. And uh, they came and made protest, but I resisted the protest and asked them to go and pay the 1,000 Leon fine to recover or claim their vehicles again. And that we were going to lose the discipline if they did not pay. Uh, they did pay, but we lost the discipline in that we were discouraged. And as a matter of fact, we were taken to court. Akibo Betts was finally given a free hand by the new military government to step up the pace of change again. After three weeks, market women no longer spilled out into the streets of Freetown. There is no parking on big roads. And even in the name of public entertainment, you will have to find your patch in a corner and do your thing there. <laughs> If one of these jolly revelers, this man, collapses, where do you take him for treatment? Well, let's find out. This is Cornet Hospital, the biggest and supposedly the most advanced in Sierra Leone. Most of its doctors were trained in the West, and they are used to modern standards of practice. Today, they are overflowing with frustration. Documents have been unearthed showing details of contract after contract awarded to companies and agents by the Momo government for the development of the health service in Sierra Leone. But the story here is one of inaction and neglect by the government and a combination of anger and resignation by health workers. Our man with the musical group, if he had collapsed, would have had to come here in a taxi there are no ambulances in Sierra Leone, none. If his condition was extremely serious and the taxi hit the rush hour, he would die before reaching hospital. His body would have been taken here to the mortuary. If his family wanted to take his body away against the hospital's advice, no problem. The mortuary was unmanned when we filmed it. The door was unlocked. There were flies in the room, which meant the cooling system wasn't working properly. If our man didn't die, but his injury needed surgery, he would have had to be rushed here. Dr. Ivan Johnson Taylor, who's chipping away there at another patient's infected bone, might have had to operate. This surgeon cannot disguise his anger and what has been going on in Sierra Leone's health service. Had to work against all odds, even operating with touch lights, power failure, water shortages, and so on and so forth. Even the air conditioning in the theater is non-functioning at the moment. So you could imagine operating in the theater 30 degrees centigrade plus. Well, it's just killing. There has been a lot of awareness amongst the community locally as well as internationally. We've been getting letters from people asking of, about what else they could give. But their main concern was that it goes through the right channel 
and everything that is donated is accounted for. Their main stress has been accountability. And has that been a problem in the past? Well, it has been a problem in the past, as I said, because a lot of gifts that were given to the country were made into personal property, you see. But now, just after the revolution two weeks ago, we've started seeing new changes. Thanks, God. Has electricity been cut during an operation? Many times. Times without number. My generator is around the corner now, waiting for power cut any moment. You mean you get electricity? My own personal generator. And you made this film, which was shown in Britain, about uh, terrible conditions uh, obtaining in this hospital. The film was later shown uh, in Britain, and copies of that video were made available to people in Sierra Leone. The government people saw it. Now, how did the government respond to you after they saw that film? Of course, I mean, I had praises from the normal people and said, well, thank God, at least somebody has said it out. But you were expecting that a government, somebody has pointed out something that was wrong, could have at least called people with ideas, at least. I mean, someone me up and said, yes, well, how could we improve what you are criticizing? Because I'm part and parcel of this country. But on the contrary, nothing was done. I was faced with intimidation and all types of harassment, more or less. What kind of harassment? Well, like the, the then Minister of Health sending me out of our office, she was just rude to me. The new government has been in place. The military has come. They took over about three, four weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Have there been any noticeable changes since then? Oh, a lot of change. Lots and lots of change. Driving around Freetown alone, <laughs> the stench that used to be there is all now gone. The congestion is all cleared up. It's even pleasant to drive in Freetown now. Rice, which people were hiding, it's all out now, free of sale. Free for sale to everybody, if you could afford it, at reasonable cost. It's a lot of change. I just wish them luck. And all I wish for them is guidance, guidance. The right people to guide them in the right direction so that this country would really be the Athens as it used to be. This is the intensive care unit at Cornet Hospital. And he hasn't got any sedation. He should be on a res respiratory machine. Yes. There is none. What else? Tracheostomy. Tracheostomy. What's that? That's a machine? Yes. Just An opening operation. Oh. Ah, that's it. You should have a sort of puncture so that he, he can be able to breathe. Um. So what's wrong with him? Oh, he's an accident victim. Road traffic accident victim. Yes. Why is he so thin? You can see his legs here. Don't you? He looks uh, undernourished. Or well, is this okay? It's okay now because he started eating. Mm. Yes. So he's, he's um, recovered? Yes, yes, exactly. This is the outpatient's reception area. So here's the doctor on duty. Usually when the emergency cases comes in, to start with, we don't have any paper here as to provide for emergency cases. So usually they will tell the patients to go and buy paper, a piece of paper. That's the paper that you are going to write on? This is the paper I'm going to write, I'm going to flag the patient. So the patient goes, he or she buys the paper, he or she comes to see the doctor, then I flag the patient. That's when you can write down what's wrong and, and what medicine the patient needs? Yes. In every case when they come, do you give them free medicine? Well, no, there is no free medicine. They leave you. I mean, you have no idea what's going to happen to them, whether they get the drugs and live or do they come back? Well, usually when they get the drugs, they come back so that I can, so that the, the nurses can treat them. But if at all they don't get the drugs, or maybe they don't even have money to buy the drugs, then they won't come back. And I won't know what has happened to them. How do, does a doctor like you feel mm -hmm. operating under these conditions? Because these are not the conditions under which you were trained. Yeah, you see, 
At any rate, I don't like this condition because before I left her to go and study, things were a little bit normal in this place. And when I was a small boy, we used to call me and they give us free drugs. But now when I came back, I found everything has gone over. Everything has become so difficult to get and the salary scale is so small. My salary, even the salary I'm getting in a month cannot even afford me a bag of rice. I have a family, I have to care for them. I have to pay my rent. How am I going to be? So this has been really difficult. So what, what is morale being like because of all these problems and that poor salary and all among doctors like you? Very low. What would be your order of priorities if you had to list them? Well, virtually, I would say as, a, as an order of priority, everything is top priority because at the moment, when we consider the bed capacity in the hospital, that has to be improved. Presently, the state of the wards is in utter disrepair and uh, efforts are being made to rehabilitate five wards at the moment. So they are all closed down now and we have to double up what has to be accommodated in 10 wards into 5 wards. So there's overcrowding? It's definitely. At the moment, there's overcrowding. We also have to concentrate on the outpatients and the accident and emergency department, which is what we are trying to work on now, because that is actually the first line in the hospital. I wouldn't say that. I would say they're terrible. The conditions are terrible. Well, I, I have a worse word for it, but I wouldn't like to mention it in this program. Captain Valentine Strasser, the head of state, realizes the urgency and the enormity of the task facing his new government. So what would be your message to the international community at this time? We need urgent help. This is a country in distress. We are very poor. We cannot start uh, without help. We, cannot, we don't have a solid base to start. We are only trying because of our commitment to, 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 to development. But we need help and we need capital inflows. We want to appeal to the donor organizations and donor institutions. We want to appeal to the international community in general to turn their attention to the situation going on in Sahara. Journalists are usually regarded as the watchdogs of society. These men have never stopped crying out loud about foul play in Sierra Leone, in spite of the attempts by Momo's government to silence them. I was picked up on December 11, 1989, and I was locked up for a period of not less than eight months. That Where? was Where? at Padembe Road, the maximum security prison in Freetown. And I was only released after a lot of colleagues came in, pleading to the president, to have me released, and then quite a lot of international pressures were heaped on the administration here. This editor was jailed 17 times during APC rule, but he never wavered in his pursuit of corruption. In fact, one of his most memorable heavyweight contests 
was against the Minister of Information, who was the man in charge of the press. The German embassy had a party uh, at the Mamiyoko Hotel, uh, and I was uh, invited. He too was invited. The, the ban on uh, my newspaper had just been lifted, the ban which he had imposed. We met there, and he felt that that was an insult for me to appear on the same platform uh, as he, at a time when uh, a ban had just been lifted. So he was threatening that I had got him that time, but he was looking for a time to give me a very good beating. But he was then drunk. So uh, I told him that if he attempted to make such a statement again, I would, I, I would give him the beating there and then. So he first slapped me, and I also gave him a slap. Um, I may come in and say, perhaps, that in as much as the press did talk, there was so much the press itself had to hide. Maybe, as I was saying, this has to do with self-censorship. So many journalists had been bought over in the last days of the APC. So much so that you had journalists who claimed to be independents singing the praises of the government in power to the extent that they will, they will cover up what actually the people wanted to see, what the people wanted to hear, and then publish propaganda stuff in, on, behalf the on behalf of the government in order to get some cash rewards. We are not going to name people. But apparently, it was such a bad condition that the press itself was not to be trusted anymore. The public lost faith in so many papers in this country. There were a few who stood out up to the last days, like Bunting's paper and Paul's paper. I mean, I'm not praising them. But that was the reality. And you had so many papers. Naturally enough, they had to go on the ground because there was not much they could offer the people. And people were tired, dog tired with what they were publishing. One day, you hear that students were plotting I mean, planning a coup against the APC, and a so-called independent paper will carry that as a front-page story. And, you know, we have the same paper masquerading, the same people masquerading as journalists. Well, to a very large extent, the press said, the press said so much, but it had so much to hide as well. These men claim that Joseph Momo's error has led to a social catastrophe in Sierra Leone. It destroyed education. A lot of people could not, uh, a lot of kids are out in the streets not been educated because these people are just squandering money and school fees are, are being raised every day and every day. You see our young girls being reduced to prostitutes. They have to hunt um, the, the ghettos. They have to hunt the, the ships for Korean and uh, other sailors who come. They have to go to the beaches. They have to go to the hotels and so on and so forth. You see uh, a general decadence in terms of morale. And that is why even within a jiffy of the NPRC coming to power. I mean, we already know that the bank vaults are full of money. You go to the house of politicians, 60 million loans is, 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 is uh, um, taken from their homes. One of the biggest tests of public support for the young military rulers in Sierra Leone was a successful national preening campaign. Old women, young men, children, some say even dogs joined in. A hundred miles away, in the provincial capital of Bo, this 15-year-old mountain of what the residents called APC rubbish was about to disappear. What you see here is the rubbish which has been gathered here for so many years, call it 10 to 15 years, untouched. It has been so long here, as you can see, even vegetation has started growing over it for so many years. And um, when the new government has come into power, they have shown to us that um, there should be sanity, health situations for our people. I had had a lot of support from the community of Bo. All around the city of Bo, every household has cooperated so seriously by cleaning their, their, their environments. And we are so much satisfied with that that I mean, we are also motivated to continue this bit of the exercise for them. I, as an individual, being the, 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 the city father of Bo, feel so happy with our new chain that we have, that we have got in Sierra Leone. And we pray and uh, wish that God being their guide, they will be able to handle all our problems because much has gone wrong in this country for so many years. The new NPRC government in Sierra Leone realized the importance of carrying public opinion with them in the exercise of effective government. 
So, one thing they did was install suggestion boxes in many public places, like Pepe. Pe